Let me read to you a passage from the fifth chapter of St. Luke's Gospel, verses 1 to 11. It's the Gospel for Thursday of the 22nd week in Ordinary Time. St. Luke writes, One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding round him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signalled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken, and so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid, from now on you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on the shore, left everything and followed him. That's from Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. What does this suggest to us? Well, it speaks of power and holiness. What do I mean? Well, it's obvious that power does not of itself imply goodness. Power is one of the earliest of a person's experiences. He experiences the power of his parents or guardians, the power of his teachers, the power of his rulers. All through life he is coming to terms with the power that is exercised over him. It is a moot point whether this power is generally exercised well or badly, whether the ones who exercise it are themselves good or bad people. If he himself gains power, the story is the same. He can be corrupted by power and liable to use his power in ways that are not good. One thing is certain, power is very often in the hands of bad people and it is often exercised in profoundly harmful ways. Great power was in the hands of Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin and Pol Pot. As a result of their exercise of power, countless lives were lost and an incalculable degree of suffering was visited upon societies over which they had some reach. Perhaps as a result of this common human experience, the religions of man do not portray the gods who exercise heavenly power as consistently good. In fact, it is a question whether there were any gods at all who were perceived as purely good. In the rituals and myths of the religions, divine power is a mixed blessing. Power is the foremost attribute of the gods, the principal thing man thought of when thinking of the divine. Man is weak and vulnerable and so he turns to the heavens for divine aid, or at least to ensure that the gods do not become irritable and hostile. All up, quite often the heavens are not perceived as a very heavenly place, but are more or less a projection of the mixed bag of the powers at work in our very broken world. However, this is not the whole story of power. Power is exercised by good people in good and beneficial ways, and at times by persons of holiness. As a matter of fact, the most powerful person ever to have appeared among men was utterly and completely holy. I refer, of course, to Jesus Christ. No one has ever had his scale of power. He could do anything he chose. He could heal any disease, feed vast numbers with practically nothing, calm storms, raise the dead, anything at all. 
in his case absolute power was in the hands of one who was absolutely good. In our Gospel today from Luke chapter 5 verses 1 to 11, our Lord is teaching the crowds from Simon's boat. He finished speaking to them and turned to Simon, who obviously was with him in the boat. He asked Simon to move the boat out into the deep, for they were very near to the shore. Go out more into the deep, he said, and lower your nets for a catch. Teacher, Simon said in reply, I have been at it all night long, but have caught nothing. But if you say so, I will let down the nets. Let us notice Simon's full and simple faith in Jesus. God's will, as manifest in providence, circumstances, directives from those above us, ushers us through doors we might think of a little or no satisfying prospect. What Christ told him to do, Simon scarcely thought to be promising or satisfying to him in terms of practical result. But he readily did it on the word of Jesus Christ. The result was instantaneous and astounding. As we heard, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signalled to their, to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Both boats were beginning to sink with the fish. It was a miracle, a sign of great power, though exercised on a small arena with a tiny audience. It was meant for Simon and his companions, principally James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's and presumably Andrew's partners. This display of power was life-changing for them, but not least because it manifested the utter holiness of the one possessing the power. The response of Simon to the unexpected miracle before him was a hearty and humble recognition not only nor perhaps primarily of the power of Jesus Christ. What he especially recognized was the holiness of Christ and by contrast his own sinfulness. Christ's power manifested his holiness and this was consistent with the entire sweep of divine revelation. God in, every, in exercising his power manifested his holiness. It is a tribute to Simon and a sign of his greatness of soul that it was precisely Christ's holiness which he perceived in the power that had been shown before him. As we heard, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at his knees, at Jesus' knees, and said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. This was scarcely the response of, say, the Pharisees. That Simon, having so commendably perceived the holiness of Jesus Christ in the exercise of his power, should then stress the distance between them is natural. Go away from me, Lord, he said. Rudolf Otto, in his landmark work, The Idea of the Holy, stresses not only the attraction of the holy, but the terror it inspires in wayward man. But there is more. Christ reveals not only divine power, not only divine holiness, but divine love. Do not be afraid, he assures Simon. God does not want the sinner who loves him to fear being in his presence. Come to me, he says to Simon. Do not be afraid, for from now on you will catch men. The all-powerful God is holy, but especially he is loving. 